Welcome to Barn Vlog, and today I'm with Julian Asele, and we're talking about Christian personalism and the left. Um, this topic was inspired because I've been in, a lot of people have asked me a lot of questions about liberation theology, which uh, um, I, how do I say this? If that's your introduction to left-wing, um, left-wing thought, uh, theologically, in any religion, uh, you don't know anything. Um, and this is not to say there isn't a lot of right-wing reactionary thought in religious circles. I would still say that, you know, reactionary thought probably predominates on religious circles. But it's, there is a history here, and it comes out of places that you don't even always that aren't obvious to the majority of people. So I wanted to start us off today talking about that. We're going to be referring to, and I'm going to cite these um, in the show notes as well. We're going to be referring to Being as Communion by uh, Zizulas, uh, an essay by uh, George MacDonald, uh, Cardinal Ratzinger slash Pope Boniface slash as I like to sometimes call him Pope Nazi face, um, the divine project, and then Martin Luther King's The Testament of Hope. Uh, so if you want to go search these texts out, and so you can follow what we're talking about, it might help you out. But let's just start today, uh, Julian. Um, why are you qualified to speak on this topic? Well, Var and I've had a, a quite a varied religious journey. A lot of my friends tend to be either uh, 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 raised in the cradle Catholics or, you know, Protestant, Southern Baptist or Christians. I was personally raised Buddhist by my mother, uh, and I was raised in a in a foster home run by the Southern Baptist Association of, of South Carolina. Uh, and I was a hard agnostic after those experiences. I, I was not particularly happy during those times for very obvious reasons. Uh, and through a number of uh, interesting events and kind of twists and turns, I converted or was confirmed into the Catholic Church senior year of high school uh, and was kind of in the conservative circles in college. I went to Yale from like South Carolina uh, and was kind of in the conservative part of uh, college at first, mostly because, and a lot of it because, I thought the way that one should be Catholic was to be conservative. I thought to be a social conservative was to be a good Catholic. Uh, now, due to a number of other events that happened, uh, and as I invested, plunged further and further in my faith, uh, I became a Marxist very shortly after college due to a number of kind of personal events, both intellectual and kind of more on the tragic side of things. Uh, I became a Marxist and became heavily enveloped in kind of Marxist political economy, uh, Marxist kind of the, the, the histor historical materialist uh, conception of the world. Uh, and as I kind of plunged deeper and deeper into my into like uh, the Marxist study of history and Marxism and, and Marx himself, uh, my Catholic faith kind of was in a kind of stagnant, lethar lethargic kind of stasis. Well, I didn't really know what to do with it, because as I became more and more Marxist, I obviously had to kind of critically evaluate, you know, the Catholic Church as an institution through the years and kind of the sober understanding that a lot of these beliefs that, you know, humans have held and continue to hold, you know, are very much molded and mediated through social and religious and political circumstances and are not just free floating ideas caught up in space. Uh, now. Earlier this year, it was reading Istvan Mazaros uh, and his book, Marxist Theory of Alienation, that kind of got me back into reevaluating my, my Catholic theology at its core. Uh, so I kind of went from Mazaros and his kind of Marxist humanism to James Baldwin, uh, as I was very heavily, I was always heavily influenced by the kind of, by the black radicals, so Du Bois. MLK Baldwin. I read like his a whole Library of America collection of his essays. 
Uh, and then finally, I read Ratzinger's uh, Introduction to Christianity, which blew my mind. Uh, it was the first book I read that made the Trinity actually sound interesting. Like I actually understood why. I didn't understand the Trinity. Nobody understands the Trinity. That's just, it's a mystery. But I actually understood this is why this is why the Trinity is such an exciting kind of phenomenon or an exciting cornerstone of reality that I totally missed out on when I was in college. Uh, because when you're kind of a college Catholic conservative, you, you just kind of mostly get fed the manualist Thomas Aquinas law. Not saying anything bad about Aquinas, but Aquinas has mediated through these kind of conservative American institutions that basically make Catholicism into a, a phone book of like laws that you have to follow as opposed to a relationship with God. Now, going through that with, you know, reading Ratzinger and then McCabe, uh, George MacDonald, uh, all these kind of theologians on the more personalist side of things, uh, I thought was deeply fascinating because number one, it made my kind of Christian faith more of a live object and made it more kind of human as opposed to a set of laws and bylaws that we're very used to Christianity. And number two, I found quite a few parallels with uh, the Christian anthropology of man as kind of proffered by, say, uh, a lot of the Eastern Orthodox kind of political religious uh, theorists, such as John Zizoulas, uh and the Marxist humanists like Mizaros and Lukash and, and those people. And it invigorated both my kind of Marxist, uh, it, my, my Marxist interests, as well as my Christian interests, my Christian faith. So that's kind of where I'm coming from and why I'm, where, where my, my credentials lie. So. Okay. Um, so to break this down for my audience I, i'm increasingly having to break stuff down for my audience because i realize that people often do not have the uh the prerequisite knowledge estevan mazaros was uh, a anthropologist sociologist philosopher call him any a number of those things who worked under george uh uh, Gorgi, I'm about to say George, Gorgi Lukash, um, directly one of the two philosophers that I've been really interested in who worked under Lukash was Mazaros and Lakatos. Um, Lakatos ends up being kind of an anti communist, Mazaros is not. Um, and what's funny is I'm listening to this and I'm like, have you read Raymond Goyce's recent, uh, basically autobiography which is basically about like being raised by Hungar by hungarian catholics and ended up being kind of a marxist humanist um although he is an atheist one of the things i find interesting about when we talk about personalism and the reason why i wanted to talk about personalism more than say like just liberation theology um one i i find the term liberation theology over overused and two um I wanted to talk about the, the trends that, that something like liberation theology can come out of uh, that are completely orthodox. There are parts of liberation theology that are not, I mean, they've never been anathematized, but they're not totally squareable with like orthodox Catholicism or Eastern Orthodox Christianity. But there are there are things in Christianity if if you under if you understand this that cut in a bunch of different ways and I think it's interesting to talk about Ratzinger, um, aka Pope Boniface, particularly because he's seen as a conservative force in the in the church. He's seen as more conservative than John Paul II and more conservative than Pope Francis. But his 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 teachings on social gospel. Um, are identical to Francis's. His his emphasis is different in how he presents it to the public, but but his teachings on like preferential treatment of the poor, um, the stuff on personalism we're going to talk about today, that that's actually in, in Ratzinger too, which means that 
believe it or not, a lot of the more conservative factions in the U.S. Catholic Church, which I find ironically tend to be the intellectual stronghold of Protestantism, weirdly, um, I think they're Protestant heretics. Now, uh, my opinion on this doesn't matter because I'm not a Christian. I'm uh, my my journey is almost the well, it's not the opposite of yours. I was, I was, uh, I was raised in a Jewish and Catholic family, and ended up being raised partially Buddhist by my father, and I stayed Buddhist. But um, the I am really familiar with christian teaching and i've been trying to get people to one i've been trying to get people to understand that the secularization of young people does not actually necessarily lead to a left-wing result two that religious people being being axiomatically predictably um gop in their morality and almost quasi-racialist is actually a sign of their decline um, in a significant way. And as I pointed out, at least when it comes to the Eastern Orthodox, uh, Oriental Orthodox and Catholic churches, racism is heretical. Um, it's not just, it's not just morally bad. It is actually a heresy. Um, so it, these are things that I think people really need to understand when they're approaching, uh, Christian thinking. And the other thing that I think is a lot of secular people, <laughs> Um, and I, this is more from my Buddhist perspective, but a lot of secular people actually think like really shitty Protestants and don't realize it. Um, and and the, when they go to deal with something like personalism, they don't have really a frame of reference to understand what's being spoken about. And leftists who want to deal with all kinds of things. I mean, right now we talk about the Israel-Palestine conflict. Yes, material conditions are what's driving that primarily, but you do need to understand um, religious differences, etc. Like, it's really helpful to know a little bit about Western right uh, Orthodox and Catholic Christianity when dealing with Palestinians because they are not a small part of the Palestinian population. Absolutely. Um, I mean, look, one of the one of the great ironies of uh, the ev the evangelical right in America is they their kind of constant cornerstone of their kind of thought is uh, Christians are being persecuted globally all over the world are being persecuted you know Christianity is a is a persecuted uh, religion that is on the brink of being made illegal in all countries but when it comes to Israel the 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 actual Palestinian Christians who live there are completely erased they're just a mon a, 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 they're just Muslims. That's all they are. No Christians there. Not even the oldest, some of the oldest sites in Christendom in the history of our religion. That doesn't matter. I think sometimes too much is made about Christian Zionism, but I have been looking at the numbers of, of it recently. And one of the things I realized that even if you took the smallest um, estimate of Christian Zionists. There's still more Christian Zionists in America than there are Jews on the entire planet. It's crazy. Like now, now I say that because people need to understand that like that's still not a high proportion of the U.S. population. It's like four or five percent. But all the Jews on the planet would only be four percent of the U.S. population, and they're like two percent now. Um, so it's. It, it, it is it is something that people need to think about when they think about like why does the U.S. Um, support uh, Israel like like that when even the Jewish community in the in the U.S. is you know um, it's about fifty five percent Zionist forty five percent Zionist agnostic or anti Zionist. Um, and when you think about the population of the of the country that's Jewish, it's only like one percent of the population. It, you can't explain U.S. policy that way. You have to explain it both materially, but also the ideological basis does come from religion. Um, but it's but it's a really strange form of religion because, like for example, Christian Zionism is not really common to get into this 
uh, in say Orthodox Christian or um, our Catholic circles at all. Um, Christian Zionism is pretty much uniquely an evangelical thing. And looking at the most recent numbers of conservative support for Israel, which is which is dropped dramatically. Um, it seems to be that even that's only tied to a certain generation of people. Um, now, what does it have to do with personalism? Not a lot, but it does help to understand a lot of where these debates are coming from, particularly once you get out of Europe and, the, and North America. If you don't understand religion and you're dealing with stuff in like North Africa or, or even in Eastern Europe, you're, you're kind of at a loss to deal with uh, the way a lot of people are thinking. And people might go, oh, what about Eastern Europe? Well, one of the interesting things, and this is overstated, it's not like Russia is the most religious country on earth, but one of the interesting things about the far of the, so of the Soviet Union is in the Soviet Union itself, actually more than in places like Hungary or Czechoslo or, or Czechia or Slovenia, etc. Um, there was a huge revitalization of religion um, after the fall of the wall. And if you don't understand that, you're going to have a hard time understanding certain, certain distinctions and tensions that happen, say, in Orthodox Christianity today. So I do think this is important. Now, that's the broad spectrum why I think this is important. But now let's talk about personalism. What is personalism, Jules? I'm glad you asked, Varn. So basically, personalism, it, it cannot be defined as a one philosophical school, uh, as like, say, maybe like Sto Stoicism or Epicureanism or, or like it, in that kind of vein. It's more a kind oh, of okay. emphasis in a kind of in, in a kind of intellectual stream within Christianity, uh, it is something that I think got its start in the early, I think either late 18th or early 19th century, and kind of built steam from there. Uh, but it really started to coalesce in I think the late 19th and early 20th century with the uh, the uh, French personalists, uh, the French personalists. Uh, I think people like uh, Mariak and, and those folks. Uh, basically, personalism in this, in this kind of modern conception is essentially basing the fundamental kind of building block of reality uh, around the human person. Now, what is the human person? Well, if you want a good introductory text to personalism, I would highly recommend reading uh, John Zizoulis' uh, Being in Communion. But basically... Personalism starts from the premise of uh, every person, every individual human being, not only having value, but having an inestimable and uncountable value and a completely unique permutation within the human race and, and within the universe. And the kind of history of like, say, Zizoulis, where he's coming from, is essentially uh, beginning with the Greeks, you have... This, you know, you have the pagan gods, uh, these kind of rapacious beings who demand loyalty, demand sacrifice for hum from humans. Uh, and the gods and the humans, none of no one is free from the kind of, how do I say this, the order of the cosmos. You know, the Greek word for order being cosmos. Uh, and so you have this kind of riot against not riot, but this kind of rebellion against this kind of uh, authority of the cosmos through these Greek plays like Aeschylus and, and those folks, uh, where you have these people who are fighting against fate with these masks, persona, you know, the Greek word for, you know, mask, persona, you know, the root word of person being persona. Now, what's a persona? Why do we care about a persona? Well, think about your favorite player. Think about your favorite movie say Macbeth, uh, you know, Citizen Kane. If you take out any single person from Citizen Kane or from Macbeth, from the main title character to the lowest, lowest foundation of like an extra, that movie and that play would be a fundamentally different play, fundamentally different movie. 
because every single persona, every single person in that play or in that production is not something that can exist in and of itself. Because every persona, every part in this play, in this production, exists by virtue of its relationship to others. Uh, Macbeth exists because Lady Macbeth exists, because King Duncan exists, because all of these different characters exist, because Macbeth is the res at, at once the result and the producer of all of these relations that define, say, Macbeth or, say, in Citizen Kane. Now, personalism within the kind of historiography of the personalists like John Zizoulis or in the 20th century with the kind of uh, Nouve Theologie the folks, I, I pronounce that very poorly, <laughs> like Balthazar or Ratzinger or those types. Um, person, the, con the concept of, of the human person emerges after, like in the second, third centuries uh, of Christianity, where we're trying to make sense of what the Trinity is. Because with the Trinity, you have God the Father, God the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And we are given these sort of statements through both, through both the Gospels and using the hermeneutic of the Gospels through the Hebrew Scriptures of each person of the Trinity being at once Com like the same in their essence, but also completely different. And in making sense of this, we have the Greek fathers, like the Cappadocian fathers, uh, such as uh, Gregory of Nyssa, uh, Gregory of Nazianzus, uh, Basil the Great, uh, and a number of other great church doctors and great you know, church fathers. Uh, basically, coming up with this concept of the person where from the Trinity, we're going to start there. God, the father is the father precisely because he lives like, or he is the father of the son. A father cannot be a father without a son or a child that's established. God, the son, Jesus, the Christ cannot be the son without the father. God, the son is defined by his, being the son of the father by serving the father and the Holy spirit is defined by his being or processing from the father and revealing the son. So, so we have these three persons who have the same will, but are completely different and they are completely different precisely through the paradoxical effect of being completely relational to one another. And the revolution in this kind of thinking of, of personhood on a cosmic level is that the problem with the Greeks, I'm talking about Aristotle and Plato and Socrates, in their revolt against the pagan gods uh, and basically putting their stake in the monotheistic absolute one, you know, the God, the creator, uh, is that they had this notion of the cosmos as still being an eternal thing and god you know what they called god the logos uh he gives form to the formless void of the universe why does he give form to the formless void of the universe well how else was he able how else was he supposed to enact or fulfill his 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 being as divinity in order, he has to be in relationship with something. Well, if he has to do that, if he has to give form to the universe in order to be, re be pure reason itself, in order to be God, is he really free? So there's this conundrum within Greek philosophy of the kind of closed system of Greek divinity, of God creating, you know, creating, giving being to the universe because he has to, but well, he has to because he's reason itself. Why isn't it? Re why is it reasonable for him to give being to the universe? Well, because it just is. But with the Trinity, and this is the revolution kind of Christian ontology with like, or the what what Ratzinger would call radical monotheism. You know, one and three and three and one. The radicalness of the Trinity is the fact that God did not have to create the universe. 
because God the Father are, was is already realizing his kind of quote unquote essence through his being the Father, the Son, and through the Spirit proceeding from him, and the Son being the the Son of the Father, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So then, why did God create the universe? Because he wanted to, because he delighted in it, because he wanted to create the universe, and he wanted to spread his love and spread his joy and to allow mortal creatures to experience what what the Greeks would call theosis or deification to become like God. By Greek, you mean Greek Orthodox, not Greek philosophy. Let's yes, yes, Greek Orthodox. Uh, yeah. to become like God, which is why we which is why personalism is heavily predicated on the human image of God. You know, we have this kind of saying within, you know, Christianity, within, within you know, even secular philosophy, liberal philosophy, I should say, of humans being made in the image of God. But what does that really mean? Well, Ratzinger, in one of the readings I sent you, Varn, uh, in the Divine Project, his assortment of essays on the story of Genesis has a great kind of summary of it, which is basically that um, an image is basically the signifier and the signified. You know, you have a photograph, it signifies, say, the Eiffel Tower. It realizes its essence as being a, sig a, a you know, a signifier of the Eiffel Tower, of the thing that's being, a of the thing that's being uh, taken a picture of. But the cool thing about the human image and what it means to be the human image of God is that God has created you in such a way that only you can understand God in the way that you can, because only you are you. You may not necessarily be the smartest or the most attractive or have all these best qualities that you traditionally think of as the best qualities a human can have. But if there's one thing that's certain is that no human being has your life experiences Every second of your life is completely unique to you, and you can only understand God in the way that you have, in the way that you can. And so, in the kind of in Christianity, you have this relationship between creator and created, and you have these very brilliant exegeses of or like rolling out of these implications through like Ratzinger and through Balthazar. And especially for even like Protestant, you know, the few Protestant kind of universalists like uh, George MacDonald, who riff off of, uh, for example, there's this great verse, one of my favorite verses in the Bible, I think Revelations 317, where Jesus basically tells, I think, the church in Smyrna, uh, if you win the fight, if you finish the race, uh, I will give you a white stone uh, with your name, with your new name on it. And only you can read it, which is basically God saying, you know, in the kind of conception of heaven that we have in the eschaton in the, the end of all things, uh, you will be given a new name that only you will know. God, the infinite of infinities, will tell you a secret that only you can hear and that only you can understand and that only you can tell the rest of creation. Because only you can worship God in the way that you can. And so this relational kind of understanding of the human person that differentiates itself from the individual, something that exists for itself and as itself, as opposed to completely relationally, has massive implications for how we think about uh, human rights, human community, Varn, I know you're you're you've read a lot of McIntyre, so I'm sure you've you're kind of making some connections there. Uh, mm -hmm. But I see a lot of this, and I see a lot of practical kind of synergies and overlaps between this kind of conception of the human person and the socialist, specifically Marxist conception of the human person especially you're gonna you're, you are gonna really have to justify that to me because i don't see any overlaps you don't see overlaps huh not at all no how so 
Um, you want me to explain myself further? Go ahead. I can explain. Sure. So what I mean by this is, for example, like Marx's conception of the human being. So you, you read the, uh, like his early writing, from his early writings uh, to his late writings, uh, even in Capital, there's this conception of the human being as at once the product of these certain set of sets of social relations and also the producer of those very same sets of social relations. Uh, Marx has this conception of the human person that is completely relational. It's not, it's, it is relational in as much as he, like, we cannot understand any individual or any, say, object in space, you know, not just individual person, but any commodity, anything in, in nature or in kind of reality without understanding the context in which it takes place. Because we live in a fully dynamic environment that both feeds into or produces that object and is being produced by that very same object and affected by that same object. Uh, so that's kind of the very general uh, overlap that I see there. And I can go I can go even deeper than that, but I've been talking for a long time here. So I don't want to suck up all the oxygen of the room. Well, the, there's a lot to, to deal with. I mean, um, relationality as a, de, as a definer of concepts is... How do I say this? Um, with the exception, weirdly, of the ancient Greeks, um, and maybe certain schools of proto-Hindu philosophy, um, most forms of codified thinking deal with relation relationality as part of the way things um, emerge. I mean, in Buddhism, you have dependent co-arising. Um, you literally don't have the concepts exist only in relation to both other people and other concepts. They don't have any essence of their own. Absolutely. Um, right. Um, well, I don't know that that's true in Christian thought, um, but it is true for the Christian, for the particularly, uh, this particular form of personalism, and it has to do with the Trinity. Um, because the relations there are well, when you get into, for example, uh, try to explain this to, to people, there are no Calvinist personalists. Um, okay, and, and people might go, Why? Well, Part of the reasons for personalism is that it is not arguing for, I mean, yes, actually, uh, it's Catholic dogma and Orthodox dogma believe in counter-causal free will. But, uh, and for those of you who don't know my very technical thing, that, that the soul is the origin of the will. The will is from, from the soul itself. Therefore, it acts it, sui generis beyond its context. However, even that in, in Catholic thought is mitigated. Um, in, in, I guess my, my, uh, my pushback on you on Marx is, yes, the, the person is defined relationally, and we've talked a lot about that. And in fact, the whole collective versus individual is to miss the point. Um, Marx is weirdly, I mean, on that he's actually copacetic with Hegel. It's just that um, he thinks that that emerges from the structures of material reality in this kind of Hegelian reading of Epicurus way, where um, humans are individuals who only exist in relations to each other because of a biological species being, basically. And this is, this is a problem that uh, you and I agree on against actually some of our close friends who are Althusserians who start trying to argue about structures and the and navigating will and all this become being like turned to aleatory materialism and i start going well if that's true and you believe in determination like that then i don't know why you believe in politics at all 
Like, right. it doesn't make any sense to me because everything's going to be the way it's going to be unless there's a random swerving of an atom somewhere. Right. Um, and I think the other big thing that, I, that I'm that i taking from Marx here is, uh, especially in the economic manuscripts, mm -hmm. uh, is his kind of notion about how communism is the, like, personalization of society and the socialization of the individual. Um, well, yeah, that that's the other big thing that I find like very big con like uh, very big parallels with here. Well, let's talk about that a, a little bit um, because because that's the part of Marxism. I think it's I think it's mis interestingly I think it's misunderstood by the new left who used it for in a lot of weird ways, um, and then by autonomous who also used it in a lot of weird ways. But there's been a tendency in Marxology to double down on the kind of modes of production, which I, I literally pointed out to people. Yes, the modes of production are important. Yes, they kind of undergird the entirety of late Marxist economic manuscripts, but they're only stated cleanly twice anywhere in right. Marx or and, Engels. And in the most abstract, uh, I mean, the first volume of uh, Capital, where it's supposed to be the most abstract and mo most kind of clean cut, so to speak. Right. And you get you what you have is this problem where you have people who have modes of production which control all human interactions and determine social relations because social relations are somehow epiphenomenal to the mode of production. Um, but they can't explain how the mode of production actually emerges from being, which even in Capital Volume One, if you actually read it closely, modes of production come from relations of production, which are just human relations of power and reproduction. That's what they are. Right. Um, and so the mode is just when you talk about that in aggregate, the relations are when you're talking about like specific types that emerge. Um, and then there are the ways that's reinforced through the fetish, through ideology, et cetera. Um, which is why when everyone wants to throw out alienation as unscientific, I'm always like, yeah, but you're literally throwing out a mechanism that, that like without alienation, there's a whole lot of stuff in Marx. that just does not make sense. Um, or, or you literally have this idea basically of social totalities that emerge either as conspiracies, basically, or they just emerge and you can't yeah, explain but, them. Like, yeah, bar, I, I controlled F. I control F alienation in my PDF uh, copy of volume one, and I only got 60 results. That means Marx doesn't care about alienation anymore. Yeah, it, it's it only, was all early Marx. Only well, that that that's that's one of the most fascinating things to me because I'm always like alienation is one of the terms that doesn't get dropped. <laughs> like species being gets dropped, yes, and there's some other stuff, but like alienation is not dropped anywhere. Like you, you start reading late Marx, and it's implied. It's in letters. Like anyway, um, so I guess I do see that as re as a relationship to personalism. The thing is, though, I, what I want to push on you a little bit is the foundation of personalism is relational. But it doesn't seem to imply any kind of automatic politics. And I say it because when I looked up personalism on my own research in Catholic personalism and then Eastern Orthodox personalism, they get to Zizula, um, I discovered two things that uh, one, personalism in the Eastern Church kind of comes from Nikolai uh, Berdeyev um, and all these. Um, Russian and Greek Orthodox Christian existentialists. Yes. Um, which, and then concurrently, and I want to point this out, and I, I think this is interesting that it happened concurrently because we don't have a lot of evidence that like Dorothy Day was reading Badev and Zazula. No. Um, concurrently, you have Dorothy Day, John Paul II, I was actually reading up how important this was to John Paul II. Like, there is a consistency of thinking here. Um, and it's interesting to me when we, you know, I was, I was saying those snarky things about uh, um, oh Pope gosh, Benedict. Um, liberation theology. But liberation theologists, 
Like, this is one of the things that you can be a liberation theologist and a member of Opus DA and yeah, actually no. agree on. I, I I apologize if I if I apply, implied this, but I want to make this explicit now. Uh, mm -hmm. Personalism by no means implies uh, uh, an automatic socialist politics. Uh, I want to make that very clear here. Uh, okay. I mean, in fact, you see a lot of this in Vatican II, uh, where or even in like uh, in Amer like the American Catholic uh, scene, where you have a lot of very weird political and spiritual alignments that one would not think. Uh, for instance, you have very pro-Vatican II bishops uh, in America or very pro-Vatican II priests who are very progressive on the church opening up, who also happen to be fairly staunch segregationists in Chicago and in uh, Montgomery and in the South. But then you also had very, very trad Catholics, very trad bishops. Like uh, I forgot, I forget the name of the bishop from Los Angeles, uh, but very trad bishops uh, who are also very surprisingly progressive on religious issues. So I want to make that I want to make that very clear that I agree with you that there is no automatic politics that issues from a explicit personalist leaning in one's theology. Let's uh, let's talk about a key figure here. I know you didn't have me read her, but. When I was looking up personalism on my own to talk to you about this, a key figure in America that comes up that even seemed to have influence on the Pope uh, was Dorothy Day. And so, mm. and so, why, like, one of the reasons why I wanted to talk about this is because Dorothy Day and the Catholic Worker Movement, while it was distributist, um, and she talked about distributism as a third way between capitalism and socialism because socialism was associated with godless communism, et cetera, et cetera. Um, she actually pretty much rejected the the not, the other forms of distributism, yes, which for people who don't know tend to be integralist or corporatist and kind of smell fashy, very pro private property, right? Um, and very like very pro. Um, class collaboration. Um, but one of the things I think is interesting about this today, and the reason why I wanted to talk to you about this is like, um, so for example, Dorothy Day was a distributist, but she was also an anarchist her entire life. Yes. She basically thought governments were bad. Um, like, uh, and, and yet I would, if I was to, to say it, it who's going to agree with her um like politically today you might have two very opposed people such as so rob amari and say ron dreyer who actually share her assumptions and that's that's an interesting thing to think about so it, i think that for the for the marxist today that actually you know puts them in a weird place but i think you're right to point out that um uh mcintyre was a marxist humanist but he felt very betrayed by lukasha's stance in in the hungarian uh, uh, yeah hungary yes and the hungarian revolt and uh and then he kind of aligned himself with the british school of marxist humanism that's like e.p thompson um uh, Rodney Hilton, Stuart Hall, uh, um, but slowly over time, he he seemed to find those guys insufficient. And also, I I, I actually need I would love for for McIntyre to actually write out how he became a Catholic. I actually have not found it anywhere. Like this is the moment that I went from Marxist to Catholic. Um, even in his book. Um, Marxism and Christianity, which is kind of about that, he doesn't actually say the 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 turning point. Um, although you get the feeling that his frustrations, like if you're gonna believe in eschatology, you might as well believe in actual eschatology. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, which just seemed to be sort of his argument. But there is uh, there's an interesting there's an interesting element to him. And this is why I mentioned Raymond Goyce too, uh, that they do derive from this like relational conception of humanity a rejection of 
both Christian and secular liberalism. And we need to talk about how personalism and liberal individualism are different. Yes. Um, because, I mean, I know it's kind of, I know we've been kind of like, we got into the Trinity and that's what justifies it in Catholic thought. It's what justifies it in Orthodox thought. Um, people trying to figure out what the Trinity is about is actually like a huge motivator in Christianity because it is sort of like, as a person who knows Christian thinking, and then knows Jewish and uh, Muslim thinking pretty well. I'm always like, well, the Trinity is where things get weird. Um, but it drives a lot. And it's specifically the Trinity. It is not just man and gods are humans. I'm going to be non-gender segregationist. Humans and God's image. Because that is true for Greeks and Muslims. I mean, for yeah, Greeks. It's true for... it's That is true for Jews and Muslims, too, as against Neoplatonists. Right. right? Um, it is specifically the relations of the Trinity, which put Jews and, um, Jews, Jews and Muslims both are like, well, are they pagans? And the answer in the Muslim case is no. And the answer in the Jewish case is probably no, but we're not sure depending on which rabbi you ask in the 9th century to 12th century. Right. Um, by Maimonides, they're sort of like, yeah, they're not pagans. Probably. Um, but that is a key driver. And I think it's interesting you bring up... One of the things that I thought it was interesting when you talk about the Church Fathers, and uh, as a secular studier of the Church Fathers, um, I actually find it very interesting that... I do not have a kind of post cosmo. Uh, what is that creed? We always call it the Nicene Creed, but it's not the Nicene Creed. Chalcedian. The yeah, the Chalcedian Nicene Creed. Thank you. Um, that you don't have the Trinity worked out that well, but you do have something like a Trinity really early on. And you haven't talked about specifically in like you were talking about the word used in like or an origin. I realize origin is not a saint, uh, but in also in like um, Anastasius, who is so we we can cite him more confidently without having to worry about some some conservative. Uh, well, I love origin personally, I'm a big origin fan. Right? Yeah, no most most uh, most left wing Christians love origin. Uh, origin has, has himself never been a mathematized. It's only his doctrine of universal civilization that's been anathematized. Am I correct about that? It's a very specific... What was anathematized at the, I think, the Fifth Council, it was a very specific conception of uh, apocatastasis, which is the, the term for universal reconciliation, where mm -hmm. basically all the devils and all the demons will also be um, reconciled with... with with uh, with God, uh, but there's a lot of kind of faulty historical things with that council uh, that kind of pro problematize the notion that oh universal universal reconciliation you cannot believe that if you want to be a Catholic in good standing because I I've had friends of mine who have pulled that up on me uh, and they say well you can't be a reconcil you can't be a universalist because this council in the fifth century said so. I said, well, uh, if every council, the Catholic, every local synod, the Catholic church has ever pulled since the first century is still valid. I, I do not want you to start pulling out those, uh, synods where we start talking about the, the Jews as the, the vendors and the bankers of Europe and how they're the, you know, Heathens and yada yada yada. Well, we won't talk about like that problem in the Eastern Orthodox Church. But um, uh, <laughs> um, there's uh, I don't know. I mean, if I was a Christian, I would only hold the the councils that everyone was at and there, and universal exorcism is valid. But that that would just be me, and uh, that would mean like three councils count. Um. So I'm not a Christian theologian, so you guys are lucky. Um, but I, I, I think this is really interesting to think about because 
when we talk about the problems of liberalism, even in terms of like wokeness or whatever, I'm, I'm putting that in quotation marks, right? Because I don't like the term. It's right. uh, not because I think no one knows what it means. I think it's a, I think a lot of people know a lot of different things that it means and you can use it abusively, even if you believe in it. So it's, um, but by that, I mean, like, the idea of, like, the person as a manifestation of the systemic, um, but not as, not in relation to the systemic. So what I mean, like, for example, like, you are your privilege, but there's nothing discussed about the relations of privilege and what undergoes this privilege other than, like, this vague system. Right. It's spoken about an abstract. Um, to me, the reason why that stuff is still liberal is that it does fundamentally, even though it's talking about the social structures, its fundamental locus of social structures is not so much the person. You even hear this in stuff like talks about bodies, right? But the individual yes. as either an agent or a body. A monad, an atom, a contract right. maker. Right. Um, and that is... That is a deviation that really begins in Hobbes. Um, I mean, Hobbes is not probably the only person who came up with it, but it's right. a, it's a, it's, a, it's a Hobbes uh, thing that is taken up by the English founders of liberalism and the French founders of liberalism, and they assume it. They assume the rational agent, universal, abstract reason. Because Hobbes, weirdly, for all of his bizarro politics, is. Uh, is at 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 base an anti-egalitarian egalitarian um so but people who want to follow me on that like he believes that humans are fundamentally equal and that's why you have to use force in a stall king it's not because like there's a natural great chain of being it's actually for hobbes there isn't a great chain of being which is why you got to have a king um and everybody's equal except we got to suppress catholics because of uh, reasons and stuff um that part of Hobbes never made sense to me, but um, because he clearly barely believes in God. But th my point in that is that's one of the locuses of the individual. Um, then you take in the Renaissance the rediscover the rediscovery through Arab trading and through trading with the with the Byzantines, and when they get when the Byzantines, you know get all bloodied by the Seljuks and the Ottomans and you have all this stuff flooding into Italy, you get all this um, Greek stuff about the unmoved mover about forms and types and essences and, and whatnot that really do remove relationality from the question. I, I've always actually talked about this because I'm like, it's actually kind of an accident I know it's annoying when someone like Carlos Garrido of Marx, uh, Midwestern Marx, like thinks that like the difference between good Hegel and bad, all of the West of the Western tradition is because we're all secretly Platonist and except for Hegel, who's really secretly a Heraclitian. And then I'm like, oh, but what about Nietzsche uh, and all the other Heraclitians? Uh, what about what about people who were inspired by Lucretius? Um, sorry, dude, that doesn't work. But there is a sense in which both Aristotle and Platonic formalism also is copacetic with this idea of a rational monad, a mm. rational, like a rational alienated automatically, like by existing. Yeah, by existing because basically because of your emanation from the unmoved mover, you get, when to get into the 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 theology which by the way if you study ancient greek philosophy and they don't teach you the theologies that undergird it your teacher is failing you yeah you don't understand it i mean this is something that mcintyre talks about in the first chapter of dependent rational animals where he yep. talks about the uh how the the default subject of western philosophy for the first few hundred years from the 16th century to as late as the 19th century or the 20th century, I should say, is an able-bodied male who can do labor and may or may not be have have the means to be relatively independent. 
And an able-bodied male can do labor, but if you're really going to be an Aristotelian, doesn't do labor. That's actually part of what it means to be fully human. Oh, uh, right, exactly. Oh, and he's also, I mean, assuming so, white because he's not be he's not owned by you know slave owners or that kind of thing, which, as you might imagine, leaves aside not just a whole chunk of the population, but the the majority of the population: children, old people, women, disabled men men who are not white, etc. Well, I mean, this is interesting to talk about whiteness in this, because what you have in the beginning and the four, and from the 14th to 16th century, it's basically between the 9th and 12th centuries, there's people trying to do it, Roma and Jews, in ways that come up with these metaphors that involve color. They don't really, though, take on as ways to classify people until you get to the transatlantic slave trade and, like, Portuguese people buying slaves from... Arab and Congolese slave traders and then trying to justify when they bought Christians. Um, but what you see there is then you have this conception of whiteness. And what happens is, you know, people from now, and I even think modern anti-racist scholars will do this. They'll talk about Roman and Greek notions of waste. And I'm like, that's, they have notions of types of people, but they're not our notions of race. What you're actually doing is you're reading the 15th, 16th, 17th misreading of ancient text into the ancient text. Right. Like, like Aristotle didn't care what race you are. Aristotle cared that you weren't a natural slave. And a natural slave had nothing to do with your skin color. A natural slave had to do with the fact you lost a war. Yeah. Um, um, but... You, you, you give that to people who are like trying to justify whatever, whatever conquest system, particularly after the end of Christendom. I have I, I do think it's really important to realize that the fall of the Eastern Roman Empire, a.k.a. Byzantium, and like everything that we associate with modernity, including the beginnings of capitalism happening roughly within 200 years of that event, that's not a that's not historically accidental. I mean, it is contingent, I guess, like no one planned it, but like, like you don't even have the concept of European, for example, emerges consistently applied to the Europeans. The moment a Christendom that is in North Africa and the former Roman empire is over. Um, what does this have to do with Christianity? Well, my friends, um, the enlightenment, and I'm going to actually take the, this is a reactionary argument that I happen to agree with, but the Enlightenment seems to come out of a very particular reading of this, of these Greek texts, um, analytically applied, and then you get Augustine and you add that in there and then you have some changes in political economy and some justifications of, of wealth assumptions. And the Protestant Reformation. Yeah, and then you have the Protestant Reformation. But we also, like, we can't get the Catholics out of this. They, they like, the, 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 the new Christians and new, the new Christian problem is, new Christians in addition to the transatlantic slave trade is kind of where race right. comes from. Um, like as a former category, like because you start getting ideas of like blood Jews, which is not something you see in the medieval period. Mm -hmm. um, you also start getting ideas about like, uh, for example, going after midwives. That's an early modern thing, like the whole burning time stuff. That's not medieval, guys. And it also wasn't really burning. It was mostly hanging. But, and it was actually more Protestant than Catholic. But, um, that comes out of this as well. Um, and you have this idea of the relational whole, whatever you think of the relational whole as, slowly being dropped for the animized individual. Now, uh, a lot of people point to, like in literature, people start point like that Christian interiority is where the individual into uh the the person enters in in europe i don't know that i believe that i don't know that like you can actually say that pre-christians didn't have a notion of person the way christians do but i do think that it gets codified in a way but the idea of the atomized individual as a as a foundation for all political order for social order for religious life etc 
that's pretty much a 15th century post-war of religions phenomenon. Like that's that is we we're dealing with the Reformation, we're dealing with the wars of religions, we're dealing with the English Civil War. That's where this idea comes from. And it's specifically uh, like coming from the rising bourgeoisie, who is a you know a class of individuals who are united by their relations to production in as much as they are not anchored or rooted to the land like the peasantry or the or the no or the nobility. And so right. you this class of like you know the the bourgeoisie and say in the cities in Germany and in the Netherlands uh, and, and in, in France who are trying to make sense of the world, uh, this world in which more and more people are unrooted from the land and where like the, how do I put, how do I, how do I put this? Uh, where hierarchy was mystified in the medieval period where, you know, Lord, you know, father, son, lord, lordship passed on to lordship, land holding passed on to land holding amongst peasants and noblemen. With the bourgeoisie, this new conception of life emerges where you really are your own, well, formally speaking, you really are your own individual. Yeah, you, know, you own yourself. I you, mean, own the yourself. you own your labor power and you can dispose of it how you wish, theoretically. Right. And, and what's interesting in Marx, I mean, this is, I guess, maybe the push on where I was pushing you a little bit. It's Marx both assumes that's true and false simultaneously. And right. it, it's hard to explain, but like he does kind of assume that like, yeah, these bourgeois notions that they're actually liberating because like now we're no longer tied to like, you know, legal caste as being actually divinely ordained. Um and when, when people talk about, like, the divine right of kings, I'm like, well, there really wasn't a divine right of kings, but there was, like, a divine social social order of right. which the king was on top. But it wasn't because the king was, like, had the power of God as manifested in the king. It was more just, like, the spiritual body is divided up in a certain way. And uh, it's getting uh, – trying to get people to understand medieval European thinking actually does – sometimes it's – more a lot of effort. complex political theology. Yes. Um, and also, like, Marx points out over and over again, force is is a economic factor because it's a social relation. But in medieval, in medieval um, ways of thinking, that's not hidden the way it is in bourgeois ways of thinking. Right. So, um, but... It's completely what? personalized. It's not an abstract force like it is in a completely capitalist society. Right. Like, for yeah, force for us is abstractified. We can talk about the forces of structures, whereas, like, no, I'm talking about that Lord's over there is a dick. Like, right. <laughs> like, I mean, it really is that specific. He is not living up to his divinely ordained thing. Hey, King, as arbitrator of God's law, why do you come smack the Lord around? Because you got to keep it, you like, and that's why there was peasant revolts. Not because the peasants even necessarily wanted power. They, it was more like that lord's an asshole. King, do your job. Keep these lords in line. Conversely, right. in England, there was also a counterforce where the lords were like, "We believe in liberty because we don't want the king telling us what to do." Screw you guys. Um, now, I don't think that's good or bad. I'm not. I, I think there's a way we can romanticize personalism, but I do think there is something lost when we talk about humans as atomized individuals who just enter contracts one just factually speaking all this social contract shit is a myth like just a, like both the both the ur social contract nor does it make any sense to assume that just because i was born in an area accidentally that i consent to that social contract because i don't necessarily and in most cases have the right to leave anyway like, so the entire contractarian understanding of liberalism is kind of based on BS. And the other thing that's weird about it, um, particularly when you look at John Locke, is they try to reconcile this with natural law, which, which eventually liberals drop, but you know what they replace it with? They either replace it with utilitarianism our our deontologicalism 
um, because they're still trying to fill in the gap filled in by natural law. So it's got to be like, oh, well, there's got to be some rational way that we can deduce this. We now have the naturalistic fallacy, so we can't use that anymore. How do we figure that out? Well, Kant's got a rule. It's a stupid rule, but he's got one. And uh, um, or we can try to figure out utility or some shit. We do, do we agree on what utility is? No, but, but Bentham says you can do math. Um, and people are like, that's unfair. I don't have to be fair to those people. Um, so um, that's, that's kind of the foundations of liberalism and what happens over liberal. I mean, like, for example, another reactionary thing that I, reactionary, I don't believe this is reactionary. I just think the reactionaries argue it is when you drop natural law, human rights don't make sense. How do you justify them? Right. You can't justify them utilitarianly or whatever. Right. Um, because they're they're supposed to be absolute and inalienable. It's where you get a lot of the uh, the dumb reactionaries who really like McIntyre, where they think like McIntyre is critical of human rights. There, that means he doesn't he doesn't want human rights because he wants uh what we want, which is uh like power and authority, just pure. No, he, he just thinks that human rights doesn't make sense once you've given up um the virtue systems that undergird them and i think he's right about that i i think like that's why it seems like everybody just asserts random shit as human rights like like anyone can claim anything as a human right effectively right um and and also that means that it doesn't really have any purchase in the modern world other than like what we other than what mcintyre says it is which is basically emotivism like okay so we've gone through all the implications. Let's get back to personalism for a second. Um, now you you really focus on uh, on Benedict on Benedict Sixteenth, aka Ratkinser, Rat aka Pope Nazi face. Um, and I think it's really interesting because I was reading uh, uh, Caritas in Verit uh, in Veritate. I think I'm trying, I'm trying to get my church Latin correct. Um, which is a uh, charity and truth. Let's just call it that. And this is an encyclical. It was written in 2009. Yeah. Um, and it's extremely personalist. And I think it has actually like the best definition that kind of corresponds with what you're talking about. And that is as a spiritual being, the human creature is defined through interpersonal relations. Well, there you go. There um, you go. The more authentically he or she lives these relations, the more his or her own personal identity matures. It is not by isolation that man establishes his worth, but by placing himself in relation with others and with God. And I think it's interesting because I see this as Thomistic, but it's not Thomistic analytic. It's Thomistic phenomenological. Um, and for those who you who are not into Catholic philosophy and whose eyes just glazed over, uh, Thomistic analytic leads into Thomism as like Christian Aristotelianism, basically. But Thomistic phenomenology leads into Thomism as like the base, like an understanding of the basis of being of which you must experience. Right. So it's whether or not you're thinking about uh, good old Saint Aquino as uh, as being key for your analytic and rational thinking are key for like your moral grounding of being right um, I, I think yeah. one thing i'd like to kind of preface when uh, talking about ratzinger who I, I would say is probably one of the best theologians of the 20th century i have a very i usually have a pretty low opinion on the you know popes and bishops and their ability to do theology well for you know a number of reasons i mean they're they're, they're more they're, they're they're pastors they're pastorally focused like they're not supposed to be yeah, like, that's why it was weird to, to but, me that Ratzinger became it became the Pope because I'm like, you picked the theologian of the of the yeah. doctrine of councils and covenants, yeah. aka the Inquisition as the Pope. That's but, weird. But Ratzinger happens to be an, an outstanding theologian, uh, and he was a part of the Nouvelle Theologian, which a ba basically to kind of prep to kind of give you a very quick backstory. Since the, Fre the French Revolution traumatized the Catholic Church. Uh, and in 1848, basically kind of sealed the deal for the next hundred years. 
for like the curia and like the church kind of being the cheerleader of reaction of like the landowning class and in many ways the capitalist class. Yeah. Uh, and I one mean, of the things literally, it leads to Demestra. <laughs> like, right. You know. and, and, this is where you get like the guild socialism and all these kind of reactionary kind of distributist kind of fantasies, utopian fantasies. Um, right. And who they use to kind of justify a lot of these kind of schemes and fantasies and kind of tracks against socialism. Socialism was Aquinas, but they didn't, they didn't use Aquinas. They used manuals written on commentaries based on summaries of Aquinas's works because yeah, are, yeah they are reading through translations of translations of translations of Aquinas's works where so, so can I I need to actually explain this because because another thing that yeah it yes the there's two things that really freaked out the Catholic Church in the in the in the in the 19th century one right. is all the French revolutions all of them um two is um Development of socialism and capitalism freaked them out. Like, yes. like Pio Nono, for example, like condemns capitalism outright in an encyclical. Like, oh, yeah, uh, he, basically, he condemns in. Um, I forgot the name of the encyclical, but you're right. Yeah. For those of you who don't know, Pio Nono is like every reactionary's favorite pope. Um, although there's a limit to his reactionaryisms, for example. I do believe he opposed the Confederacy, even though they thought he would be on their side, because he doesn't actually—he didn't actually think slavery was justified. So I guess Confeder he wasn't. Confederacy sympathizers like to uh, say that he did because he wrote a a favorable letter or a, a charitable letter to I think uh, Jefferson Davis, but that was mostly because there are Catholics living in the Confederacy, and he didn't want you know priests, the priests and bishops, to be kicked out or have hospitals. You know, po po politics essentially, but in any case, um, lightly kind of pro Confederacy, if not for the fact that they kind of stood for, you know, land ownership and kind of quote feudalism, uh, whatever. Anyways, yes, the Catholic Church was quite afraid of modernity, uh, and so they trotted out Aquinas to condemn private to to basically at once condemn the unlimited use of private property as the bourgeoisie and the Catholic uh, or not Catholic, but the factory owners, you know, would kind of fire workers at will and would, con but also at the same time, condemn the abolition of private property, reading it as still nevertheless a sacred thing. Uh, so kind of walking a very tricky tightrope and justifying a kind of very like, a stagnant theology of property that would kind of did a that was kind of aiming at a third way, but then you get to the early to mid nine early to mid twentieth century with the Nouvelle theology theology guys, you know Balthazar, uh, Ratzinger, or earlier than this uh, Blondel. These are the guys who basically said we should do we should look into the early church fathers. We should open up the books and we should do what we call resourcement, ad fontes, going back to the sources. Uh, so you get a lot of the Greek fathers kind of back into uh, Catholicism, like reading the Greek fathers, uh, reading them and studying them. And yeah, they're no longer seen as like proto heretics. <laughs> they're no longer seen as proto heretics. Uh, so you no longer had. Augustine and Aquinas as the two big dogs of uh, of Catholic theology, and so Ratzinger comes in with uh, with Balthazar and kind of these sort of quote unquote left wing centrist more more like kind of lefter guys of Vatican II and posit this very kind of radical conception of theology that is very much more much more personalist, much more open. And relatively more progressive than uh, in its understanding of it, uh, ecclesiastical relations than, say, the old guard uh, in the Curia and in the Vatican. 
I mean, from Vatican II, basically, you, you get the development of, uh, you know, with these and with new theology, you get, um, you get the development of Catholic social teaching. Which, I mean, one thing I'm going to say: if you want to understand Latin America, and like any time the left has had any success in Latin America, they've had to adopt, even when they didn't want to, um, language of Catholic social teaching. And uh, what what is that language? Human dignity, um, uh, subsidiarity, and solidarity. And I, subsidiarity is kind of complicated. It comes from the, uh, but um, um, solidarity and the common good, uh, universal charity, and, and the preferential option for the poor. Preferential option for the poor. Um, no, there's no. There's no like uh, Christian dominionism in Catholicism that would be a heresy, and it would be against Catholic social teaching. And also, distributism and social justice are actually uh, like the church will condemn you, and even conservative Catholic thinkers like Chesterton and Bollock will condemn you for coming out against progressive income tax or are or, or, like not being for antitrust laws, <laughs> like. And, and and I'm like, yeah, literally, those are matters of of uh, of heresy to believe, believe it or not. Um, so, it, it, which which I do think makes one of the ironies of the American situation that the conservative Christian movements key thinkers right now are mostly Catholic, but they are heterodox Catholic thinkers from the standpoint of Catholic social teaching. Almost all of them. Like, and that's also why there's like a like crypto Cede Vaticanist movement <laughs> in America, even though they won't call it that because that's explicitly heretical. Um, where they basically like, yeah, well, you know, we don't really want to deal with stuff. Um, uh, in this Catholic social teaching way. I mean, there's other, there's parts of Catholic social teaching we would consider conservative, the sanctity of human life, you, uh, which is against uh, abortion, also against fornication and, uh, and contraception, which uh, that one's probably hard for most leftists to do. But also it's against euthanasia and capital punishment um, and stuff like that. So I think that's... Uh, uh, something to to think about when you I mean, when you're the, dealing with Catholics. Mm -hmm. One of the one of the ironies of the uh, the right wing Catholics in America is they they hate the Vatican so much, uh, not not because of the whole pedophilia thing, but by any means of the, by any stretch of the imagination, the enable the enablement of pedophilia within the highest uh, kind of ranks of the Catholic Church, but because Pope Francis. Uh, you know, very rightly, I would say, limits the Latin mass in, in America because he rightfully proclaims like these are people are using the Latin mass as kind of incubation tubes of, of, of reaction and of isolation from normal society uh, and is not good for the soul for like at least the people who are coming to a lot of these Latin masses. Uh, and so they they did they condemn Francis for the social justice stuff, and they condemn Francis for the uh, you know getting tea with Castro, and they condemn him for you know uh, what do you call it like kicking out certain bishops like Bishop Strickland in Texas a few weeks ago, but they don't kick him out for the one thing they've been chomping at the bit for the the whole groomer panic, you know the whole pedophilia thing, the Catholic Church has you know, been struggling with, to put it lightly. Yeah, yeah. they don't they don't talk about that. I mean, like, honestly, they, the religious in general don't want to because everyone comes at Catholics about that. But if you actually look at the stats, it's bad with all religious authorities. Bad everywhere. <laughs> like, particularly, I mean, Protestant with Protestants has actually gotten really, really bad in the last uh 20 years because oh, really 
Yeah, uh, I, I think that has to do with the fact they don't have social force anymore. Like, be, they are effectively isolated from society, so you have weird enclaves. It's the same reason why you have these problems in marginal political groups. Um, mm. Like, because these problems ha happen two ways. You're, you're afraid of power and you're isolated from it, or you have a lot of power and you hide people from it. Like, those, but they end up doing the same thing. Um it's it's a it's a kind of a a big problem in in general and it's not unique to the catholic church but yes you will notice they're not attacking the church on that anymore um in fact you know a lot of them probably like uh boniface the the 16th because they ignore his social teaching and um because oh, they yeah. Uh, they like the idea of basically an inquisitor being Pope. Um, but this is a, you know, it's an interesting problem. Um, and I, I do think American leftists really need to take this somewhat seriously. But one of the things that I've been pointing out to people is like, uh, in general, people under 40 are highly secularized today. They're, 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 that does not mean that they're a rational atheist or anything. They are not. No. Um, uh, but they're, people under 40, about 50% of them are largely unchurched. Um, and for good and ill. And a lot of, and, you know, a lot of it comes for good reasons. Um, but it also means that they often can't talk to the people who, who are churched. And in the United States... Right now, the only Christian groups that have been kind of growing at all um, since the mid-aughts have been either Orthodox Christians or Catholics. Um, Orthodox mm -hmm. Christians through conversion, Catholics through conversion and immigration. Um, and so if you're not conversant in Catholic thinking, you're at a disadvantage with dealing with a large part of the population, particularly a large part of the immigrant population. Right. Um, which is not to say that like every Latin American person is Catholic. Protestantism is growing down there too. It's it, that sometimes like figuring out reactionaryism in a, in a place like, uh, like Col Colombia is actually kind of hard because you have both evangelical reactionaries fighting Catholic reactionaries, fighting progressives, fighting, like it's it's it's, it's so weird down there. yeah i mean but you you do need to be able to speak that language and i worry that american leftists just don't at all they don't know how to become conversant in this and they don't know how to pick up on ideas and i don't mean this cynically okay i don't mean like oh we should cynically try to convince like trick all the christians uh into becoming good socialists that's not what i'm saying like I, I know, I know some like, like I know some Jesus was a revolutionary people who who actually think that way, and I'm not one of them. Um, I'm not a Christian for one thing, but like, but I do think whenever we we hit something like personalism or something where we can share a way of talking about uh, social problems in a way that does not cede that to reaction is important. Yeah, and. Um, because my brothers and sisters, um, new atheism didn't lead anyone politically that they weren't already going. Just want to put that out there. Like, yes, the majority of new atheists ended up just boring ass progressive Democrats. I get it. But then you have a bunch of other ones who are not. And you're like, weirdly, the IDW and a lot of like weird, even quasi like James Lindsay and Dave Rubin come out of the new atheist community. Like do not assume that secularity means that people share your values. Um, and I get that it's hard right now. Cause you're also dealing with stuff like, like, uh, like a Burgerfeld and whatnot. I get it. Um, I get that the law right now, and the fact that, like, yeah, you have a bunch of, like, 
hyper conservative Catholics on the Supreme Court that are, but those Catholic that theologically those those thinkers are actually out of line with both the majority of American Catholics and with Catholic social teaching. And, and importantly, like it is important to understand that the American right uh, they are not the moral majority right. They're, this is no longer the 1980s. No, uh, this is a much the, smaller group of people. For one the, the ones who were most vociferously behind Trump in 2016, I think in 2020, were the most unchurched pockets of the Republican Party. And um, I, I mean, you just look at the the Republicans who are, you know, the, the, the kind of main subject of the Republican Party. Uh, there's this conservative kind of Catholic writer, Matthew Walter, who wrote this, this article, I think that, and he put a really good name for it aptly. He called them the barstool conservatives who were conservatives who had vaguely, very vaguely socially conservative values, but only insofar as they comported to a conception of like, oh, I am a all American burger chomping, cigarette smoking guy who has a job on the line and who watches pornography. And I like to, I, I, I like, I, you know, who likes sex basically. Uh, and that's not a very socially liberal, well, not socially liberal. That's not a very socially conservative conception of the, of a conservative that we would understand it from like, say back in, back in the eighties or even the nineties. No, I mean, one of the things I would say is like the idea that, for example, um, Gen X antinomianism would end up the image of conservatism is a very weird phenomenon. Um, and and at least I've put it this way. If you think you didn't like the religious right, wait till you meet the not religious right. Because oh. they're, they're going to either be neoconservative super realist are they're going to be racialist for the most part like that's that's what you got yeah um i i saw a video of a woman at a the the national prayer breakfast the breakfast that the conservatives the republicans like to have in congress once a year this is a lady congresswoman she you know fairly young and she was just openly talking about uh oh yeah i was living with my my partner you know we're not married I was living with my partner and he wanted me to give him a hand job before I left. But I was like, oh, I'm, I'm late for work, honey. And she just said this in front of the national prayer breakfast in front of all these Christian Republicans. That's crazy. We <laughs> I mean, the Laura Berber phenomenon is actually not unique. Like, uh, and Trump, Trump himself is a good example of this, but uh, I would. There were there were groups that were trying to hold out against it, like the like the basically the Latter Day Saints, for example, here in Utah. But they're they're not. Like it's a division between the. I mean, one yeah. of the funniest things, honestly, were a bunch of people who tried to leave the church because it was too pro vaccine. Oh, it's so funny. Uh, I mean, like in insofar, and this, this is very important to understand. Insofar as the you know the average Republican is still socially conservative. You have to understand that it is it is it is not coming from a a thoroughly Christian like faith. It is coming from an own the libs like conception of like morality, of like yeah. If they are, if they are, yeah, if they are homophobic, if they dislike women, if they're if they hate minorities, it's no longer because they're kind of you know evangelical or Christian. It's because oh, this makes the purple haired. Starbucks barista in living in my head angry, therefore it must be good. Yeah, I think this uh, this is this is something that's hard to to get people to understand because I've actually pointed out one of the reasons why like the GOP right now is so erratic is like they don't just not have a consistent ideology. Like let's be honest, conservatives haven't had a consistent ideology in most of the 20th century. That's not unique. They also, for most of the 20th century, the advantage the right had over leftism is it had community para institutions that were strong, mm -hmm. right? Um, and and I don't just mean that because they had money, that wasn't all they had. Like they had churches, they had like they had the women and family stuff too, and the left really kind of didn't. Um, 
that's not true anymore. Like, no. yes, they have institutions with a lot of money, but the, you you don't have the same kind of cultural reach. And and places where that cultural reach is predictable, such as such as like say the black community, where there's still a lot more churchness. Um, it's not predictably like when people talk about reactionary Christians, they have to pretty much talk about it dividing that group up by race and focusing on a white Christians, which are the fastest, like one of the fastest declining demographics in the country. Like, so it's, it's an interesting problem. Um, and, and, and I mean, like, this is where I think on, on an individual level, I, I find personalism to be very helpful. Uh, I, there was actually a post, one of my friends posted and I retweeted it. Uh, where it was like a uh, heartbreaking, uh, the worst person, the worst person, you know, is loved beyond all measure by the creator of, of the universe. Uh, and that's a very tough conception of love because it's essentially asking you to hate someone who is, I mean, essentially a monster and that's only possible for God, but that's nevertheless something that we as Christians have to strive for. I mean, very obviously, that's not a standard that Republican Christians or even a lot of evangelical Christians who are Republican, uh, they're not holding themselves up to that standard. Uh, but I find this kind of ethic to be interesting as something that, you know, as a socialist who tries to, you know, do engage in praxis and something I find a lot in McIntyre of understanding that no matter what, like I am not trying to liberate society from the bonds of hate and, and and the power of capital because it'll help the oppressed uh but also because i am trying to liberate the oppressor from this role that they occupy which at the end of the day dehumanizes them and this is something that mlk hammers in that essay i sent you on agape mm -hmm. where you know uh black christians who are marching in civil rights uh, we're not simply marching to liberate themselves, but to liberate their enemy and to conquer the enemy by making them you know, their friend, because that's agape. It, it's, it's interesting to me to think about this when you talk about like the way, you know, I have some reactionary friends who complain about, uh, you know, what they call like woke leftism is just secular Calvinism. Um, and every now and then I'm like, well, I don't know, but sometimes I think you might have accidentally a little bit of a point because there is no bridging. There's no view of like the social order that we want to instantiate is not just about resentment and revenge. It is also about like, we think it's going to be better for everybody. Right. Like, like, no, we can't bring it about all. I mean, like, unless you're, I guess, an immediatist anarchist, you don't believe you can bring it about all at once, but you do think like. Like Marx, Marx and the dictatorship of the proletariat. It's not to have a permanent dictatorship of the proletariat. It's so you can abolish class altogether. Right. That's the goal. Um, and if you give up on that goal, uh, and I think a lot of socialists do from the gate, um, then what you normally, you know, what you have as social justice is basically just revenge. And that's oh. not really, you know, and to me, it's because a whole lot of people have mixed like this. The, on one hand, they've taken this atomized individual, even though they'll talk about social structures and, and people, but they still talk about it in terms of individuals. Otherwise, you wouldn't say shit like check your privilege. That's an individual focus thing. Um, then they will combine that with like utterly cynical points of views that assume that everybody always is just in for their best because they basically think that Nietzsche's right. And I'm like, that's a disaster for a leftist project. You've taken liberal atomism and Nietzschean um, hermeneutics of suspicion that basically every, what everyone's really about is just power. And that's all it's about. Um I don't even see how that's, I don't see how that's Marxist at all. Like, that's not like, like, that's not like, we don't like, like, if you believe that and you're a socialist, I don't know why you're a socialist. I really right. don't. Um, and, and in that sense, I do sometimes feel like disagreements around abortion and, and whatnot aside, 
um, which I don't think are small disagreements. I don't want people to think that I think that, but like that, that I, not even putting on my, my religious uh, beliefs at all, but also just like talking about this, even as a materialist, I have more in common with certain types of religious people who believe in community and communitarianism than I do with someone who has a Nietzschean plus a liberal atomist view of the world. And like, I don't necessarily agree with everything the religious people want, need, or believe in, but I do understand their conception of what a human being is better. And I do think it's something that we can both speak to. Whereas if you assume that everyone is a cynical actor, no matter what, there is no way to reason with you. Oh, because yeah. anything can be justified by that. I mean, it's it, it all comes back to to kind of bring it again to the to Christian personalism. It's um, it's knowing that we are all one in Adam, where we are all connected, and so when we oppress another, we actually dehumanize ourselves. I mean, this is something that you know very basic in the Black radical tradition that you know they they there's a lot of kind of personalist elements and like. Uh, 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 you know, Baldwin, the decolonialists, uh, uh, I, I, I always mispronounce his name. He's French. Cesare M. 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 Cesare M. Yeah. Yeah. A I M E. For those of you who uh, just want to anglophone everything. There yeah, there we go. Um, and, and, you know, I think about that and I apply that to. Israel and the Confederacy, especially post recon, like you know, Reconstruction, because I see a lot of parallels of Du Bois's Black Reconstruction in Israel. Insofar as we're talking about a ruling class who, in their construction of a society that is based totally on oppressing this other and sequestering this other in a dark corner of the society, have basically made themselves into paranoid schizophrenics. And no matter how much of an olive branch the oppressed tries to lend towards their oppressor, say, for example, you know, black Republicans during Reconstruction to the planter elite, the planter elite cannot, but think, cannot help but think, you are trying to kill me. You're trying to kill my family. That is why you want my land, because you want to murder me because you hate me, even though, you know, the black Republican says, no, I want to build a society together, but that requires some concessions on your part in order for us to live peacefully. And I see that. And I compare that to what's going on in Israel and the fruits of oppression have created a ruling class not just a ruling class, but also the middle class and lower class strata in, in, in Israeli society that is frankly schizophrenic and paranoid and culturally impoverished and completely dehumanized because they are living in fear 24 seven. And that, that is the, that those are the fruits of de those, those are the fruits of, uh, of oppression. And yeah, that they're not just living in fear. I mean, to me, they also have to export fear. One of the things I will say is like, there's a reason why Zionists are usually willing to cozy up with thing with people who you would otherwise see as anti-Semitic. It's because like the fear is also a justification for their national project in the first place. Absolutely. Absolutely. Like, whereas like I, as you know, a person of some Hebrew extraction, um uh would would say like I have just as much right to live here as anyone else to live amongst to live amongst the goy because I don't see us as different people. Like, um, I don't see like, ironically, uh, and I used to say this in college it really pissed my my other Jewish friends off. But I, I like ironically the two groups that, that seem to think that the that the Jewish people are secularly special are Zionist and anti Semites, <laughs> right? Like. As opposed to someone like me who's like, we might be religiously special, and I'm not because I'm not a religious Jew. But, like, 
there's nothing special about us as a people of anybody else other than our our history of oppression. And by the way, I don't buy into this stuff about the Shoah being historically unique. We're not the only hist- oppressed people from a middle strata of society that's ever existed. Like, in fact, I can think of many groups when people are like, oh, well, the anti-Semitism is unique. And I'm like, okay, what about Parsis? What about Coptic Christians? What, like, there's plenty of analogous groups and other societies that get attacked in a similar way. And um, I just bring this up because it is it is deleterious to the people living in that society, and it definitely over time, it is deleterious to, I mean, I, I do, no, I do not think that, like, Zionism is the only cause of anti-Semitism in the world. I'm not stupid. There's a certain group, number of people who'd hate you no matter what you did. But... Do I think it helps? Absolutely not. Like, um, and so for me, it's like, it, I, I think it is distorting. Like, I, um, I, I, I do think, for example, um, well, you know, growing up, growing up, uh, white passing and Southern. Right, like I am ethnically ambiguous, but I definitely passed for white. Um, and I, I, you know, and because I passed for white, I, I go ahead and say if I if you pass for white, you effectively are. Yeah. Um, right. Um, it, it, you know, um, the 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 ability, the relief that I felt when I when I felt like I could just like. You know, admit the problematic history, admit that even if I didn't portray this and even if I that I benefited from this privilege, but then like be able to integrate in my city, which was a city where like it's a mixed race city, but and people live right on top of each other, but they don't interact outside of work. Right. And the freedom that you got when you could just like start moving around and not worrying about it because people vouch for you as part of their community is such a fucking relief, right? In both directions. Um, and, you know, when people ask me, you know, when I go abroad, like, where would I go? If I wanted to go, I always say Mexico or Egypt, even though I love South Korea, but there was no way for me to integrate into South Korea. Whereas I, I could, it helps to be Muslim in Egypt, admittedly, but, but I could become effectively an Egyptian. I learned the language, I, I keep the cultural traditions, et cetera. I can become, I can definitely become effectively Mexican. Um, those kinds of, those kinds of, of societies are a relief. And one of the things I worry about, about like when we think about peoples and ethnic groups, for example, religious ethnicities are a driver of ethnicity, but they're also ethnicities you can join. Right. Um, they're, they're, when you think about them in terms of kinship studies, they're a kinship that you can become a part of hmm. and still be, uh, and you're still part of your blood kin and everything else too. But now you have another family of which you are a part of. I think leftists really do need to take this kind of stuff seriously about our relationships to each other, not assume this atomized shit. Talk about, you know, understand these religious conceptions because these religious conceptions are based on kinship. And one of the things I'll give Christianity, uh, you know, it's imperialistic AF, I'm not going to lie. But one of the one of the advantages of it is that it is a unis. It does have a view of universal kinship eventually. Like. Um, that's part of the, you know, of of the claim of Catholic of Catholicity in the first place. Like, and people go, well, that's not kinship. Yes, it is. What do you think godparents are? You can't marry your god. It's considered incest to marry your, like a child of your godparent because it's a real form of, of relation in, in the eyes of the of canon law. So, like, um, this stuff matters. Um, and not even to mention the, um, I mean, how, how like, Christianity influenced, uh, I mean, Marxism through Hegel and the German idealists and, and that kind of thing. I mean, it's for not good just, and ill. For good and ill. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, for good and ill. It's not just uh, Christianity is not just useful for understanding and perhaps coming to some common ground with, you know, other you know Christians, you know, working class, middle class, or otherwise. But it's also 
very helpful for understanding the intellectual history of the movement uh, of which you are a part. Absolutely. I, I don't think you could understand. I don't think you could really understand socialism or liberalism without understanding at least why, like what the religious traditions they're breaking from are. Right. Uh, particularly liberalism. Like it really doesn't make sense until you start figuring out what it's coming out of, what its assumptions are. Um, and so if for no other reason, people should read this for that. And also just think about like, why seed, why seed religious discussions to reactionaries alone? To me, that doesn't make sense. Like, like, yeah, the, I, you know, I, no, I don't want to live in a socialist theocracy. Like, I, you know, that's not my goal. Um, uh, you know, and if you were, if you were trying to make the red Soviet of, of, of our father, the Pope, I would probably not be happy about that. But I do think that like, there's a way in which I need to be able to talk about solidarity and stuff on religious terms and just accept people where they're at and as they are. And not with this, oh, we're going to secretly like flip you over and convert you. I don't think that's going to work either. We have to just, it's like, these are the values that we share. Can we build off that? Because a fuck lot of workers are religious even now. Like, you know, like honestly, they are statistically, you know, slightly more likely to be religious than middle class people. So it's, it, it, and, and, to make it even more so, if you're of color, that's even more likely to be true. Like, so if you don't speak this language and understand this language, there's a whole part of the world that you can't communicate with. I mean, that's the, that's, way. I mean, that's the mark of someone who has, you know, exceptionally kind of, uh, you know, kind of good relations with others as like an organizer is someone who, um, there, there's a great saying by uh, Herbert McCabe, who is a Marxist Dominican friar, and one of my favorites. Uh, he has this saying about the difference between love and indifference, where indifference, one says, I don't care what you do. You know, love says, I don't care what you do. And that difference is a millimeter wide and a million miles deep. Uh and that is the kind of conception or the, that, the kind of disposition I hope to kind of cultivate that I've, I've been cultivating and hope to continue cultivating, you know, with my, with my friends and acquaintances and people I don't know of, uh, they could be conservative or liberal. I could go home to South Carolina. I could be back in New York or DC and I can have conversations and find common ground about, you know, uh, the necessity of, building a, a better future for ourselves and our children and for even, even our enemies who oppress us and who are actively working to make the world a worse place. Because if you, you know, as a kind of someone who sympathizes greatly with personalism, if you are creating a, a society that is for the betterment of all but one person, that is not a society that I want to be a part of. That is a powerful statement. And on that note, Jules, where can people find your work? All right. So uh, you can find me on Twitter at Catholic Claude. I also have a Substack that is that should be linked in my Twitter Twitter bio, where I write about both Marxist political economy and biblical exegesis. Uh, and I hope to be publishing some more essays in the future once I. Uh, you know, learn Spanish. I've been learning Spanish recently, been devoting my waking days to it, which is very fun. Uh, but yeah, this has been a wonderful conversation. All right. Uh, people should check you out, even if you're on the blasted X machine. Um, <laughs> and uh, uh, I don't hate X because of, of uh, Elon Musk making it a hellhole. I hate X because it was already and always was a hellhole. But anyway, um uh thank you and people should check out your work and it's been a great conversation um and we're outie absolutely and varn link the the readings in the in the youtube description. i will i will i'll, I'll make sure that you the at least that they're listed so people can find what we were talking about today fantastic well it's been wonderful varn thank you for having me thank you for coming on